morning. This morning, Lord willing, we're going to conclude the remainder of chapter 8 and then begin to take a glance into Genesis chapter 9. This is our study through the book of Genesis. We are entitled this study Prologue. And if you have been with us, we have just finished the flood narrative in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. You know, most uh, scholars really take the flood narrative all the way into chapter 9, and, and thus I, I agree. But this morning we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. So if you have your Bible, let's read the first few words of Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. God's Word says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Again, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Everything that we have witnessed in our study over the last several weeks causes these eight words to just leap up off the pages of our Bible. They speak to the fact that Noah was a man who had his priorities in order. There's no delay here. Just as in the case that Noah built the ark, there was no delay, and thus there is no delay here. The very first thing that Noah does after stepping off of the ark, according to verse number 20, is he immediately builds an altar to the Lord. Why? Again, verse 20, Noah immediately builds this altar to the Lord. Why? Because the Lord saved not only his life, but his wife, three sons, and three daughters-in-law. Why else? Why else the first thing he does after stepping out of the ark, why else would he build this altar to the Lord? Anybody else got another thought? I've got my own thoughts, but I want to hear from you first. The earth is still there, the land, okay. It's time to barbecue. I don't think Noah was from Texas. Yeah, I couldn't build it in the, in the uh, ark. That might cause a little bit of a fire. Here's the reason or at least the reason that I understand from my study. Because Noah understands nothing should take higher priority than worshiping God. Nothing should take the preeminent position of giving God the utmost glory in this moment. Think about it. Noah led his family by faith and obedience into the ark, right? Sustained them for the period of over a year inside the ark. God commands him to lead his family off of the ark. And now his first act as a spiritual leader of this family upon the dry ground is now to lead this very same family in worship to God. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. To you. Let me tell you, church family, you had a decision to make this morning, did you not? 
What was first priority to you? This morning, you made a decision to join us in our assembly to worship and praise God. Thank you for being willing to do so. Now, another decision was made. Many of you have made the decision to stay after worship to study God's Word together. Praise God that you made the decision that you should have made. That what was of first priority to you was to give God the utmost glory in worship this morning and then in study of His Word. Because in essence, you may not realize it, but you have come today before an altar. An altar that was constructed upon your own heart. When you are presenting, as the New Testament teaches, your life as a what type of sacrifice? A living sacrifice. The sacrifice of your praise to God. What a glorious thing this is in verse 20, that as soon as Noah steps out onto the dry ground, job number one was we will worship God. We will give glory to God that He has delivered us through this flood. We will give glory to God that He has spared us from what everyone else suffered. We will give glory to God that He has a purpose for us moving into the future. We will give glory to God that His sovereign control over this entire planet, we will give glory to God that everything has worked out according to God's master plan. I truly believe, class anyway, that this moment, these first eight words should serve as instruction for our lives, meaning the first and foremost thing about our lives is we are worshipers of the living God. We were created, the Latin phrase, sole deo gloria, meaning we are to give glory to God alone. In other words, the highest aim and the apex of our existence as a believer, as a worshiper, our highest aim is that we give the utmost of our existence to praising and glorifying God the Father through Jesus his son. I'm not just speaking of Sunday morning, though, am I? Am I just talking about what we do here on Sunday morning class? No. I, I think every moment of our life, every day, we should be finding ways to give glory to God. In reality, and I, you know, I hate to use this phrase, but I. I do believe that there is to a certain extent a lifestyle of praise, a lifestyle of glorifying God. It's not just a once or twice in a week occasion. We should be ascribing honor to the Father throughout our day, knowing that it is God who is constantly, continually, at work in the affairs of our life. Every moment. I mean, listen, I, I cannot stress this enough. You, you don't go through your day in only a brief moment or two in your day, God is involved in your affairs. That's not the way it works. God is constantly involved in the affairs of your life. So if He's that involved, shouldn't He deserve and receive our glory more often than we might often give Him? that praise. By the way, let's not overlook the fact 
that this word altar, A-L-T-A-R, in the Hebrew language literally means the place of slaughter. That's what the word in Hebrew translated in our English language, altar. That's what it means, the place of slaughter. And so what's going to be happening, class, on this altar? What's going to be happening? Animal sacrifices are going to be made upon this altar. Church family, this was not a barren altar. He didn't just build an altar to be barren. He built this altar for the purpose of worship. And how is he going to ascribe this worship in this moment? What is he going to do? Again, he is going to conduct animal sacrifices sacrifice upon this altar. Noah was told to bring not just a male and female of every clean animal, was he? Look back to what we studied. How many of each clean animal was Noah to bring upon the ark? Seven pair. Okay? Seven pair pairs, okay? And that means that there are how many pairs available at this moment to go on the altar? Six. There's six, really. I mean, I don't know that he, in this moment, uh, sacrificed six pairs of each uh, clean animal. I don't know that, but we know how many God told him to bring, right? So you're at least going to need one pair to repopulate the earth. By the way, this is all about giving adoration to God. Cannot stress that enough. And by the way, isn't this foreshadowing something else? Isn't this a moment of foreshadowing? And what is it foreshadowing? Well, it's pointing to the ultimate sacrifice, right? the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Again, verse 20. Again, let's read this again. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every... I guess there answers my question, does it not? Every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar? Uh, that word every would mean every clean animal. Maybe not every one of the clean animal, but every clean animal, right? If I'm reading that correctly. Now, naturally, because this is a burnt offering, like Ronnie said, we got Texas barbecue starting up, right? No, I, be serious. Class, there was no doubt a rising of a scent. I think the Bible calls it an aroma. Is that right? A soothing aroma. So you have smoke that arises from this altar that Noah has constructed. And this smoke ascends upward. And verse 21 says, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. Now, we know that God is a spirit, right? God is not flesh. Does God have a physical pair of nostrils? What does it mean here when it says, the Lord smelled this smoothing aroma, that it was pleasing to the Lord. Well, a couple of things to keep in mind. First and foremost, we don't know exactly when this took place, but at some point or another, as we learned back early in Genesis with the offering of Cain and Abel, the Lord had prescribed a certain type of sacrifice. And this, again, on Noah's behalf, is an act of obedience by Noah 
to worship God in the manner which God had prescribed. This scent, this aroma, ascends upward and metaphorically here, so to speak, we have God breathing in this aroma and it tells us it was what? Pleasing to God. And then there's a phrase that is amazing. It says what? And the Lord, what? What does it say? The Lord said to Himself. Literally, the Lord said to His own heart, what? I will never again curse the ground on account of man. Before we go into that, any questions on what we've studied thus far? Anybody? All right, let me make something very clear. What we just read, God has said, I will never again curse the ground on the account of of man. Let me make something very clear to you here this morning. There is no, listen carefully, no remorse expressed here in this verse on the part of God. This is not God showing remorse for what has happened to mankind. How do I know that? Because God is perfect. Are not all of God's judgments righteous and perfect? Sure are. All of His judgments are holy. Therefore, this is not God having second thoughts about everything that has transpired. No, as horrible, I mean as horrible as the flood truly was, we got to be honest, God did the just thing by judging the entire human race. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. What did it say about the thoughts of mankind? Well, they were good most of the time, right? Is that what it said? Their hearts, their thoughts were continually evil. This is also, just to be clear, this is also not God nullifying the curse of Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. Let me get a volunteer to go back and read that so you know what I'm speaking of. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. And get a volunteer to read that for us, please. Yeah, I was going, I don't recognize that, that translation very well. Somebody else got that? Ronnie, you got it? Yeah. Go ahead, brother. This is what Adam said. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil will you eat of it all the days of your life. All right, this what we've just read here in Genesis 3, 17 through 19, the cursing of the ground. You come back here to Genesis chapter 8. This what we've just read in verse number 21 and 22 is not God nullifying the curse of Genesis 3, 17 through 19. You say, Jonathan, it's not, if it's not that, what is it? 
These words are really and truly an expression of the grace and mercy of God. God in compassion chooses to not curse the ground again in the manner which has been thus carried out through the flood. Yes, I think we know quite well that there have been and will continue to be localized floods that have stricken the earth, right? We know that all too well. However, a worldwide catastrophe of this nature being the flood, will it ever happen again? The whole earth being covered by water, will it ever happen again? No. That's the way I understand it. So this promise made here is not in response to anything good in man. It's not that, that God looks down and sees enough goodness in man that He goes, okay, I won't ever strike the earth in this manner again. It's not made in that respect. What is made clear here in the latter part of verse 21, it says what? For the intent of man's heart is evil from his What's the word? Youth. Now, one thing I'll, I'll point out to you, because there are those who believe in the doctrine of original sin, that I, I've heard preachers say babies are vipers in diapers. It's not funny. That's one of the saddest things I've ever heard a preacher say, that babies are, are so sinful that they would, you, you should be afraid of them. They're that sinful. Now, we, we've got friends, I've got friends of mine that are in churches that don't even know that their preachers believe that. That's why they want to baptize them as soon as possible. Notice the word, though, is youth. These are not babies. These are youth means at some point in their youth, what enters the equation, church family? Sin. But they're not born in sin. It did not say, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his birth or his conception. It says his youth. There's a difference. But that, I mean, really and truly, that, that phrase is a, an important statement that Moses recorded here. That as God holds back, his judgment from again judging the planet with a flood as he has done, it's not because man is any better. It's not, and by the way, we're going to learn in Moses, uh, excuse me, Noah, not too long from now, things aren't really all that much better, are they? Um, man is not evolving upward. He's not becoming better and better. No, man is still man. Man is still plagued by this fatal disease we know is sin. Again, as we notice, God says, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. The key part of this conclusion in verse 21 is the phrase what? Look at that. What is the key part in that phrase? As I have done. Now, does that exempt mankind from future judgment in any other manner, does it? No. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, But by His word the present heavens and the earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment, and destruction of ungodly men. All right, verse 22. Oh, before I go to verse 20, any questions on verse 21? All right, verse 22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter and day and night shall not 
cease. What comforting words to hear that no matter how evil man may be, we still have these seasons upon which we rely upon. Could you imagine if we had no knowledge of when seasons might occur? How might we plant? How might we harvest? We would really have no way of determining those things, would we? But we have a regularity of seasons. Thank you, Lord, for still showing us enough grace, despite our wickedness, that you have allowed us to have the seasons that we have. That's why, uh, you know, listen, I'm just as human as everybody in this room. We get in August and we're saying, oh, I can't wait for it to be a little bit what? Cooler. And then we get in January and I, we say, can't wait for it to warm up. Just, I mean, maybe we ought to just stop and say, thank you, Lord, for August. Thank you for Eric. No, and serious, thank you for the seasons, right? For the regularity of them. As human history moves forward, there are going to be seasons of the year. Seasons of life. And life will move forward on this planet uninterrupted until when? Until the second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, there's uh, much talk today about the destruction of this planet, is there not? A lot of people will disagree with what I'm about to say, but let me assure you, nothing will happen to this planet unless God says so. Let me say it again. It's okay if you disagree with me. But nothing will happen to this planet unless God says so. If you take God at His word this morning, and I hope that you do, this planet will continue as God has established it until the time of Jesus' return. And this earth will remain as it is because we have a sovereign God who is holding up this earth in the palm of His hand. I hope you believe that this morning. I have so many notes here that I'm not going to get to today. I apologize. Um, it is 11.28. Uh, I tell you what let's do. This will close up chapter 8. But before we close up chapter 8, I want to give you an opportunity. Anybody have any questions or comments as we close up class today before next Sunday morning, Lord willing, we move on to chapter 9. Ronnie? There, there would not have been the drastic change of seasons that we know and either enjoy or not enjoy, right? Um, there would have been a, a, a more moderate climate of which you know, man would have enjoyed for those uh, years between creation, the fall of mankind, and, and, and the flood. Of course, the, the flood as we've seen... Uh, catastrophically changed this earth's nature in many ways. Many ways. And I still don't understand all of that, Ronnie. In you know, trying to study for this and, and preparing these lessons, I've tried to read as much material. I've tried to watch as many videos as I can on apologeticspress.org and just trying to, to learn and soak up as much information as I could, but I, I only but a small amount understand all the changes that this earth underwent due to the flood. But I do think it was quite drastic. Any other comments or questions? Where did they get the seeds from to plant? 
Every living thing. What's that? Yeah, I, I, every living thing. For food, everything. Seed, everything. It's not like they got out of the ark and then uh, they, the Lord had a packet of seeds for them sitting on the ground. And, and there would have been naturally, I think, those things that would have grown. Uh, one of those things was the olive tree, right? Remember what we read last week? What grew down at the base of the, of the mountain? The olive tree. Not everything had to be replanted. Which, again, phew, my mind, but I accept it. Yeah. Had to find their way. Let's pray together before we leave today. Father, we delight in your word and we delight in the study of your word. Father, I'm grateful that you have led us through the study of the account of the flood that destroyed humanity, save Noah, his wife, and his three sons, and his three sons' wives. We're grateful that your word says that you looked down and saw Noah to be righteous in his own time. We know that does not mean that Noah was perfect or that Noah was truly righteous as the Son of God is righteous and perfect, but that comparatively speaking, Father, to the generation of which Noah lived, he was blameless. Father, I pray that that could be said of all of us in this room that compared to those in this world that we are living righteously before you. We're grateful that you have given us the righteousness of your son Jesus, that you have justified us just as if we had never sinned, and that you are sanctifying us, Father, that you have sanctified us in your truth and your word is true. Be with us now as we leave this place and go about our afternoon. Give us safety as we travel. Bring us back, Father, tonight, if at all possible. I pray that all of my brethren would rejoin us this evening as we study and worship together once again. And Father, for those that cannot be with us, I pray your strength upon them. May they feel our love and, and your presence with them this very morning. We're grateful for your family here at Waters Road, for our shepherds, our deacons, for all of our ministry team, for all who serve here within this body. Bless them, encourage them, and keep them. And it's through the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Glass.